Hey, I'm Özgün. I'm one of the founders at Citus Data. Uh, prior to Citus, I was a software developer in the distributed systems engineering team at Amazon.com. Today, I'm going to talk about CStore, a columnar store extension for PostgreSQL. Within this talk, I have about 30 slides and a live demo. The slides are fairly technical, so if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Before I dive into the talk, I'll spend just two slides to talk about what Citus DB is, to put things into context, and then I'm going to switch back to the C Store FTW part of the talk. As a quick question, prior to this conference, how many of you have heard of Citus DB? Okay, that's a fairly large number. And in one sentence, Citus DB scales out PostgreSQL for real time workloads. Citus DB shards and replicates your data. And when you send a query to Citus DB, it automatically parallelizes the query across the machines in the cluster. And Citus DB isn't a fork of Postgres. So we didn't take a particular PostgreSQL version, say 8.0, forked it from there, and never looked back. In fact, before writing Citus DB, we looked into the integration points within PostgreSQL and the APIs that Postgres provides. And you can almost think of Citus DB as a distributed query planning and a distributed query execution engine that uses the planner and executor hooks within PostgreSQL. For the end user, what that means is you get all the newest PostgreSQL features, you get native support for all the data types, contrib packages, and extensions. In fact, our customers use the HStore, Hyperloglog, and other extensions a whole lot in Citus DB. So you, as a user, you get the exact same PostgreSQL behavior. A picture is worth a thousand words. And this is the second slide covering the higher level architecture. I have an example table in here. And then that example table is sharded into multiple shards. Each box in this diagram yep, represents a shard. And then we have worker nodes. We have a worker node in here. I'll call this worker node number three. And you can think of each worker node as an extended PostgreSQL. We have a few user-defined functions defined here to facilitate the creation of shards, a few user-defined functions to move the shards in the cluster, and a few user-defined functions to repartition the shards on a different dimension for large table joints. In a sense, you get PostgreSQL with a bunch of user-defined functions on the worker nodes. And the abstraction we follow in here is that we have a shard, and then that one shard maps to one PostgreSQL table. So if you were to log into this instance, and you did a backslash D with PSQL, and if you did a backslash D with PSQL, you'd see a bunch of PostgreSQL tables, each representing a distinct shard in here that has part of the table, the bigger table that we declared in, in this place. And we also have a master node. The master node is also a, an extended PostgreSQL. When you send a query to the master node, in here, the, master, the distributed query planner in the master node takes that query, transforms that query into, its uh, into a commutative computation, and breaks up the pieces in there into many smaller computations, pushes them into the worker nodes in here, does the computations, gets the intermediate results, merges them, and gives them back to the user. And as a quick note in here, uh, the master node, uh, we don't keep any data on the master node. All we have is the shard and shard placement metadata. So at a higher level, there is no data stored on the master node. At a higher level, does this architecture make sense? Cool. Those were my slides on Citus and the talk. We have five sections in this talk. The first is the motivation section. Why do customers want a columnar store? What's the motivation for a columnar store? After motivating the talk, we're going to start with a live demo to see C-Store FTW in action. Then we're going to talk about the file storage layout uh, that we used for the columnar store. It's an open source file storage format, and we're going to talk about the details. Next, how did we integrate the org file storage format into PostgreSQL? What were the decisions that we made in integrating it, and why did we make those decisions? Finally, I'll present some benchmark numbers and conclude. And on to the motivation section. 
this is one of our customers coming to us, and this is their data. They basically have a table of 30 million rows and 700 columns. So it's a fairly wide table. Fairly. Fairly, yeah. <laughs> and on this data, they're running simple SQL queries. So there is one or two aggregate functions in here, a few filtering operations, and some group buys. This and queries like it are the typical queries that they're running on top of that previous data. And they're using a row-oriented store. You can think of the dots in here, each dot as 100 or 200 columns. So this is 100 columns, this is 100 columns in here. And then they say they ran the previous query that we've seen. For the row-oriented store to execute this query, because there is a row after another row after another row, it needs to go over each row, and more importantly, each column in here, including all the hundreds of columns that aren't in the query itself. And then the row-oriented store then gives that data back to the executor, and the executor takes that and does what it does. Filter operations, aggregations, and group buys. Obviously, what's the problem here? The cost, obviously, here is, in the example with 700 columns, we ended up reading all of those 700 columns, but we only needed five of them. If you go back to the SQL query, if you imagine that SQL query, we were only using five of these 700 columns in the query. And their data set size uh, was 40 gigs, not small, not large, and we ended up reading more than 39 gigs of data that we didn't have to read. And if you're using rotational disks, that's a lot of disk bandwidth. Even if you're using SSDs, which tend to give much better disk throughput, you're still spending 60 seconds during the sequential scan reading all of these columns that you didn't need to read. And even if you're going to memory, if you're reading the data from memory, and you have a very, very high I.O. bandwidth, you're spending four seconds just bringing the columns from memory into the CPU itself. So that's a pretty expensive operation, and you're wasting lots of I.O. bandwidth here. Let's go back to the same SQL query and look at the columns that we needed to read. I marked them in blue here, so we have the ID column, we have the price column for the aggregate functions, we have two columns uh, for the filter operations, and the group by weight. Now, let's look at the column-oriented store. In this example, we can picture this ID column as being sequentially laid out on disk. So you have the ID column that's sequentially laid out on disk, and the column next to it, the size column, is either in a separate file, or it either lives at the end as a separate chunk. And now when we run the previous query over this column-oriented store, we first read the ID column, and we don't need to read anything from size, because these are laid sequentially on disk. We just jump over to price and read the price column. We again jump over 200 columns in here, and read the quantity column, and so forth. So basically what we're doing in here is, when you think of each column as being laid out sequentially on disk, we're skipping hundreds of columns that we don't need to read. And that's more or less the basic motivation for a columnar store. You're reading a subset of the columns to reduce the I.O. bandwidth. This data could be in memory or on disk, but it's most helpful when you're reading it from disk, obviously. And because we're grouping columns of the same type together, say we had an integer column, we're putting together integers together, the data also tends to compress really well. If you have texts, texts are grouped together, integers grouped together, and they give really good compression ratios. And within C-Store FDW, we have PGLZ as the default compression algorithm, and the ability to add other compression algorithms as well. And when you're writing to disk, you take a group of values, you compress them together, so you write less data to disk, because the data is compressed, uh, they occupy less space on disk, and when you're reading back those compressed values back from disk, you read less as well. And that's more or less the basic motivation for columnar stores. Now that you're super motivated, let's see a live demo. Jason will give the live demo on our part, and I will go back to the technical part. <laughs> Did the motivation make sense? Okay. I think your query example has a 
you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're right. All right. I think it was price and weight, and then it didn't fit into the slides. Okay, so my name is Jason Peterson. I also work at Citus. And uh, I also once worked at Amazon on distributed systems in the CloudWatch department of AWS. Um, so I'm gonna demonstrate a quick install of CStore FTW and some queries using the TCPH uh, workload benchmark. Um, and then I'm gonna hop over to EC2 and show you guys uh, two clusters um, of Citus machines, uh, just two little worker nodes, so not very big. Um, but on each, I have uh, the TPCH data set loaded with a scale factor of 100. That's roughly 240 million rows in one table that's often joined with another table that has 60 million rows in it. Um, and in one case, I've loaded it using just plain Postgres, and the other case, I've loaded it using uh, CSTR FTW, and I've, uh, those two tables I've specified using columnar stores and the, the compression that Isgin talked about. So let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new uh, 9.4 database for this demo. And I'm going to switch to it and start it up. It's a shell script I have. Um, All right, and it's just an extension, like Isgun said. Um, so you can install it using pgxn, and that's a pretty lightweight way to do that, so I'm just gonna do that right now. It'll pull it down, it says version 1.2 was found, somewhere up here behind the compiler output. There you go. And uh, it's installed. Um, one thing that we need to do before we get started is edit the uh, Postgres conf to add this to the shared libraries. Uh, the reason for that is that we use some of the hooks in order to get the, uh, the copy command so we can actually copy things into the columnar store in an um, optimized way. Um, so we need to make sure that we have the library loaded whenever the query session starts. So we'll pop into postgres.conf. Uh, we will find shared preload libraries, and we will add PG, or, sorry, C store FDW. Uh, is shared preload libraries necessary, or can you use the load, you know, the load keyword as, as an session? I believe that might work, um, you know, but the, the risk there is that you forget to do that one time, and then you know, you're gonna have some weird kind of unsupported errors pop up. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what would happen, but you know, the, the copy command would probably just tell you that you can't copy to foreign tables or something like that, right? But, in, uh, or maybe you would do it in an unoptimized fashion. But um, by getting the hooks in there uh, ahead of time, it doesn't really have too much of an effect on performance to put it in there. It's just, you know, kind of best practice. So I'm gonna restart my uh, machine and Let's get started. Let me get my uh, schema loaded. Um, so the schema here is the TPCH uh, schema, which looks like this. A um, bunch of pretty simple tables. And at the very bottom, we have the two big tables, orders and line items. And you can see here we specify a server, which uh, is an artifact of the way the foreign table wrappers work in uh, Postgres. It doesn't really have too many options uh, for C store in particular because we automatically manage where the files are created, um, which means that you can create a table and not even say where you want the, uh, the backing uh, chunks of the data to live. Um, and then I also specified the PGLZ compression library to be used on the data. Um, that's particularly important because you can imagine if you have a big run of integers, um, especially if they're like a key, right? You may have huge contiguous runs of the same number, um, even if it's like a, a string, uh, within a certain data set, they'll be very similar. They're gonna compress very well, um, which as Isgin said, can result in uh, less disk space usage, which also is another way of getting less disk IO. Um, so let me start up a PSQL session, and I will load that uh, thing. I need to create the extension. Uh, that was at the top of there, right? So let's do tpch. Okay. 
So you can see I've got all my tables, and I'm going to go in here and load the data. Um, give me one second. I'll do it in parallel to kind of speed it up. OK, so this should complete probably 20 seconds. Um, and as you can see, it's copying in all the data. And in the case of the uh, C-Store FDW stuff, it's actually going to be compressing it as well. I believe we had eight tables. So one, two, three, four, six, seven. Huh? Yeah. OK. And as you can see, this is just the standard copy command, standard copy output. Um, up there in the noise of XARGs, you can see the command that's actually being run. Uh, the TPCH benchmark suite produces pipe delimited value files, so you can just hand those over here. I guess around the last one. Yeah, that's the line item table. Okay. While we oh. Oh. Sorry, there we go. Um, all right, so we got it loaded. And I have some queries in here in the TQ folder. Um, and we'll pull this up real quick and demonstrate just running them. I have it set to echo them, so you'll get to see the SQL. Uh, let's run query six. Thought I had it set to echo them. Query six. Am I doing echo all wrong? Okay. It's on? Apparently not. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at the queries. I'm going to run this query. Um, like Uzgan said, it's often just, you know, they only care about one big table. They want to do some aggregations on it. Um, another query we may be looking at is query three, which does a couple of joins here. Um, but again, uh, kind of analytic workload on a couple of key columns. Um, so just having those in a contiguous fashion is great for workload. And then also uh, query 12, which again, the two big tables, orders and line item, which in my demo are 6 million and 1.5 million rows respectively, um, and do some group buys and some, some order buys. So we'll you know, drop into the PSQL and run those guys. And you can see they complete fairly quickly. Um, and I, I am gonna pop back out in a second and show you guys the uh, difference on disk size in terms of these uh, tables and the way we're actually representing them. Um, so, let's look at how big they were to start with. So, if we look at the line item file, it's 719 megabytes. Yeah, and when you load that into PostgreSQL, it's about a, uh, a gig of data. Yeah, I think so it's... It, it increases by a bit. Yep. So, if we go over to my C store demo data directory, we will see that there is a C store FDW file, right? And I think this is the relation ID of the table. Or no, that may be the database. Yeah. And then we see, yes, here are the relation IDs of the two tables. So one's line items, one is orders. Line items is the bigger one. And we see that it's 243 out of a starting number of 719. All right, so we're saving about 500 megs. Um, that's not just a disk space thing, right? That, that also affects your OS's uh, page cache because it doesn't have to read, you know, it's reading compressed pages basically. Um, it prevents I.O. And, and it also does let you store more on your machine. Um, so now I'm gonna hop over to the big machines. I have one that's plain and one that is a C store based. Um, Okay. And 
just to show you guys. The line items table. It's got 240 million rows. And the orders table, you'll remember I think query three and query six both uh, did a join between orders and line items. Apparently some of these are plural and some aren't. Um, six million, right? So pretty big data in here. Um, and let's get the TPCH queries up. All right, and we will have a race between the Postgres-based table and the CStore-based table. I will give Postgres a head start. All right, so for this guy, we've got six seconds coming back. Um, still waiting over here. I think the number should be about 22. 18, okay, so surprise me this time. Um, so you can see that the difference, and the only difference between these two clusters, it's a, a C3 4X large with two C3 2X larges behind it. Uh, for those of you not in the Amazon speak, uh, we're looking at, I think, uh, four physical cores on each of the two back-end boxes and about uh, 15 gigs of RAM. Um, and they also have a SSD backing their data. Um, the only difference here is that those two tables, line items and orders, have been changed from being regular Postgres tables to using the C-Store FDW wrapper. Um, we have two questions. Let's take the questions and then move into the talk. Sure. I just wonder if you run it again with the files. If what's going to happen? So it's, it's not actually in the file system cache because we're working with uh, near to several hundred gigabytes of data. Um, so the whole, the big benefit of c -Store FDW is about on-file uh, layout, right? Um, I have run these before. I mean, these have been running for the past hour, but I ran them before the presentation. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're already reading from the cache. They may be thrashing it. Um, there was a second question. Oh, same question, yes. So uh, the big thing is you want them contiguously laid on a disk because you know you can't fit your data set in disk. We have 100 gigabytes of data here, um, you know, or more, maybe I think 150 or two. Uh, and so lets you do more. Yeah? This is open source on GitHub, I think is going to be covered that shortly though. Any other questions about the demo in particular? Yeah, the, the schema that I showed at the beginning is the same as uh, the ones. So it's the same data set, just not on my laptop. They're out in EC2. But yeah, they use the PGLZ compression on those two tables as well. All right. And the cool thing about the demo is it's all Postgres. So you just create, instead of creating a table, you say create foreign table, and then everything else is the same. live demo, and then back to the technical details. So before we started working on the columnar store, we wanted to get a picture of the landscape. What are other people doing about columnar stores, and how are they doing it? We looked into people working on columnar stores, and we grouped them into three buckets. One, bucket one was people who took an existing database, who forked it, and then wrote their own columnar storage engine on top of it. So basically, the database that they worked on became its own self-contained proprietary database solution. A second group was on the Hadoop side of things. So there's been a fair amount of work done on Hadoop, specifically on the Hadoop distributed file system, to come up with a columnar store. People were writing a lot of data into HDFS, and then they were reading a lot of data from HDFS. And then they wanted to read and write less. So there was work done on the Hadoop side of things, and it was open and published work. They were making progress on the file specifications, 
and we thought that was an interesting trend. And on the PostgreSQL side, with the foreign data wrapper machinery in place, there were a few interesting approaches. For example, you have an external columnar store database, say such as MonoDB, and then you'd write a foreign data wrapper that connects to that columnar store. So when a query comes into the foreign data wrapper, it goes and reads the data from that columnar store itself and gives it back to the PostgreSQL executor. That was the third approach that people uh, that we've seen and that people have done. Oops. And now what we did was we took the best of approach number two and approach number three, and now we combined them together. So what people, what we wanted to do was we wanted this to be easily usable within PostgreSQL itself, and at the same time, we didn't want to introduce any external data, uh, dependencies on external databases. I'll start with approach number two, which is the columnar store file layout. Rewinding back a few years, the first work that came out of the Hadoop site and became popular was the RC file format. This is joint work between Facebook and Ohio State University. And if you're building a columnar store, let's say you have 100 million rows or records, one way to lay that out that data is you put 100 million values of column A, 100 million values of column B, 100 million values of column C, all sequentially laid out next to each other. What these guys have done, the Facebook and Ohio State guys have done is instead they put a million values of column A, a million values of column B, a million values of column C, and a million values of column A sequentially laid out on disk. So they do first horizontal partitioning, and then they lay out the columns through vertical partitioning. This work was published in 2011 on ICDE. In the paper, they talk about their motivation for picking this approach and its performance characteristics. And once Facebook picked this up, it was integrated into Hive, and then it became quite popular. Then, a few years later, there was a second generation of the RC file called the optimized RC file, or the org file format. And the primary motivation for the org file format was twofold. One was the indexes, skip indexes to skip over unrelated columns. Second, unrelated values. Second, uh, they wanted to enable different compression methods within the same file. So you can use gzip for column A and snappy for column B, and if certain compression methods do better with certain data types, you can actually mix and match them within the same table. And before I dive into the org file specification, here's a slide that repeats the benefits. One is the columnar layout. Two is compression, so you group uh, columns of the same values like uh, together by default 10,000 values and you compress them, so you get the compression benefits. And another benefit is skip indexes or min-max indexes that filter out unrelated values. Here's the specification itself, which is basically a copy-paste from the org website. We have the stripes on the left-hand side. In here we have three of them. And by default in C store, 150,000 records are grouped into a single stripe. At the beginning of your stripe, you have your index data. So these are the indexes. And say your query is going over column two and column four, you look at this index data in here, and now you jump into the offset for column two and the offset for column four, and you don't need to read any of the other data in here. So if your query is only touching column two and column four, you just skip over the rest of the columns by looking at these indexes. And these indexes are very lightweight, so they're tiny. And when you run queries over your C store tables, the index data is almost always in memory. So you can, because these guys are in memory, you can skip over unrelated data without touching disk at all. So those are the indexes. They're again fairly small. And then you have the actual data in here itself, here. These are the records or tuples. You have 150,000 of them grouped together. And all of the values in column one appear sequentially laid out on disk. All of the uh, values in column two appear after column one. And then the values in column three appear after column two. There is a second level of indirection here. So this is, uh, which is basically each column with 150,000 values in it is grouped into blocks. And by default, each block has 10,000 columns. There are two reasons to have this block. One is that's the compression 
grouped together. So we take 10,000 values and compress them together, actually ORC does. So that's motivation one, like the compression groups. The second motivation is the min-max indexes that I just talked about. So on each block values in here, the org file captures the minimum and maximum values, and then it gets saved into the indexes in here. That's the basic org data layout. Any questions? Yeah. And there is something to be said about compression too. Current compression method within the default compression method within C store is PGLZ. This is the algorithm PostgreSQL uses for its toasted values. One difference is in PostgreSQL, you take one toasted value, you apply compression on that value, and then you write it to disk. Within C store FTW, we take 10,000 values by default that are of the same type and apply PGLZ on that, so we get better compression benefits. One thing I like about C store FTW is that it's pretty easy to add new compression methods. This is important because you might want to choose one compression algorithm if you're storing your data on an SST, and choose another compression algorithm if you're writing this data on a rotational disk. In fact, you can even use different compression methods at the column block level. Obviously, this flexibility is pretty cool that you can use different compression methods, but the natural question is, how well does the default compression algorithm perform when we group 10,000 values together? These numbers are from the TPCH benchmark that Jason that showed. The TPCH benchmark tables have 10 to 20 columns each. And each, in each column, you have a mix and match of integer, double, text, timestamp. So it's different data types. The biggest table in the benchmark is the line item table. That's your event or facts table. And the other table names are laid out on the x-axis in here. I normalize the table sizes to one to show the compression ratios across different tables. So these are here. And when you look at these graphs, you see you get compression ratios of between 3 to 4x, depending on your table. So the line item table was 9.1 gigabytes in PostgreSQL, and then it shrank down to 2.4 gigabytes. So the default compression algorithm compressed nicely here. Okay, the question is, okay, it compresses by 3 to 4x. What does that get to the end user or the customer? And the answer is that it depends. If your data is in memory, then your effective memory size increases. If you have one gigs of RAM on your machine, you can now fit a working set of three to four gigs into the machine's memory. It's almost as if your machine had three to four gigs of RAM. If you're on SSDs, you may be worried about your SSD costs, that they're expensive. And then if you have two terabytes of disk space on an SSD, compression can increase the effective disk space on your SSD to six to eight terabytes. So you get more bang for the buck on an SSD. On rotational disks, if you're using them, chances are you're bottlenecked on the disk I.O. Your sequential disk I.O. is around 100 megabytes per second on a good commodity disk. And with compression, your effective sequential I.O. increases to 300 to 400 megabytes per second. This is because you're reading the data from disk in compressed format. A second benefit, a secondary benefit, I will say, for the rotational disks could be cost savings. If you have a single machine, you probably don't care about the cost of a single disk. But you, if you have a cluster, let's say that stores a petabyte of data with replication enabled, and you have 300 machines to store that data, then compressing by a factor of 3 to 4x reduces the cluster size from 300 machines down to 100 machines. So you get a cost savings benefit for your big data deployments too. So this wraps up the second benefit, compression. We had the columnar layout, compression. Now let's take a look at the skip indexes. For each column block of 10,000 values, C store FTW saves the minimum and maximum values among those 10,000 values in an index. When the user runs a query, we extract all filter clauses from the query. In the previous SQL query that we looked at, we had quantity greater than 100, that becomes filter close one. And then we had last stock date less than 2013-1001, and that becomes filter close two. So we extract those two filter closes, 
And we then basically apply PostgreSQL's constraint exclusion mechanism. So we create two constraints for those two filters. We then evaluate the constraints against the min and max values that we captured. That way, we don't write to write any code to support different data types. This is, when we were writing this, was really exciting to me because if you look at the work that the Hadoop guys did, we were saving from writing a lot of code by just writing one function to create these constraints and use the logic within uh, PostgreSQL itself. Okay, the natural follow-up question is, when did these skip indexes help me? These indexes are useful when your data has an inherent order to it, say a time dimension. So you take data that has a time dimension, you put it into CStore. You have a query that has a filter clause on that time dimension. With these skip indexes, you can actually find the data that you're looking for and skip over the unrelated values. Or you could sort the data on one dimension and you could load it up uh, that way. That's another alternative. To summarize, the three benefits to the org format are the columnar layout, compression, and skip indexes. Are there any drawbacks? Looking at org as a Postgres user, one important drawback is it only supports integer, double, text, timestamp, and a few other basic types. And as Postgres users, this felt very limiting to us. Postgres has about 40 data types, and we wanted to support all of them. We also wanted to support the data types in contrib and extension packages, and new data types that users could write. We therefore use PostgreSQL's data type representation instead of the one specified in the org file format. This helped us in two ways. One is, with the min-max indexes, we didn't have to write any extra code. So it came by free, like free with PostgreSQL. Second is, this way, we don't need to pay the overhead of serializing and deserializing data into an other file format. We can just read the data from disk and give it to the Postgres executor. So we save that uh, serialization and deserialization overhead. A second drawback to ORC is that it's designed for the Hadoop distributed file system. And table join operations in Hadoop and res resource usage are an afterthought. The nice thing is PostgreSQL foreign data wrappers already have an API defined for statistics collection. When the user runs analyze on the table name, that API collects random samples from the data. CStore FTW collects those random samples and gives those random samples back to Postgres. Postgres then goes ahead and constructs histograms, most common value frequencies, and other related statistics, and then puts those statistics into PGSTAT. CStore then uses those statistics to estimate query costs, access path costs, and then chooses the best query plan. For the end user, what does that mean? What are the benefits? One, it means that CStore will respect the configuration settings such as WorkMap and make more informed resource usage. The second benefit is when you have table joins. Because CStore can do cost estimation, PostgreSQL will pick the best join order and the best join method. In summary, we overcome the second drawback to org format by using PostgreSQL and PostgreSQL sampling and cost estimation APIs. And benchmark results. Hadi from our team gathered benchmark, uh, these benchmark results. And we also have these numbers available in our blog. We use the industry standard TPCH decision support benchmark. And to be honest, this isn't the best benchmark for CStore because each table only has between 10 to 20 columns. And with our customers, each table has between 100 to 700 columns who are using CStore. So the benchmark isn't tailored towards wide tables in any way, but it's a standard benchmark, so we went with it. And I'm going to present in memory and on disk numbers on 10 gigs of data in EC2. In these benchmarks, we compared vanilla Postgres, columnar store, and columnar store with compression. First, I'll start with rotational disk numbers. In these benchmarks, just as we run one SQL query after the other, so we're only using one CPU core per query. And I'll open a parenthesis here. The numbers that we have here are somewhat bottlenecked on disk I.O. I'm saying somewhat because we're only using one CPU core. If we had had side to CB where we parallelize queries into multiple CPU cores, 
the under disk I/O bottleneck would become much more significant. In the case of Citus DB, the difference between the blue line and the orange lines are much higher. And in here, the orange lines are bottlenecked on CPU. And when we have more CPU cores available, the orange lines become shorter. So I'll close that parenthesis on the Citus DB side, and I'll come back to the single node PostgreSQL numbers. Here we picked representative queries from the TPCH benchmark. We also dropped the caches on the machine to ensure that the data is coming from disk. The blue lines in here are vanilla Postgres, red lines are columnar store, and orange lines are columnar store compressed. And the query runtime benefits end up being about two to three X when you're using a single CPU core. Again, if the data was, if the data was coming from disk and if you were using multiple CPU cores, the benefit would be notably higher. To put the amount of disk I.O. saved into context, we also ran I.O. top on all of these queries. This way, we could see how much disk I.O. was issued for each single query. In this graph, the difference becomes much more dramatic. Query 6, for example, issues 9 gigabytes of sequential disk I.O. with vanilla Postgres. Oops, here. And if you look at C store compress, there is more than a 10x improvement that's from 9 gigabytes down to 0 0.8 gigabytes. So there is an immediate reduction in the amount of disk IO you're issuing with C store compressed. <coughs> and for completeness, these are the in memory numbers. When we're running in memory, the bars are much closer to each other. This is because the queries are basically bottlenecked on the CPU. There are two things to note here for the in-memory numbers. First, the primary benefit in the in-memory case is that your effective memory size increases. So this was on a machine with 15 gigs of RAM, and if our data set size was 30 gigs, we'd still be C store compressed, we'd still be serving these queries from in-memory. It's almost as your like 15 gigs of RAM becomes 45 gigs of RAM. The second note or the question is, can these in-memory numbers go any better? the ones for C store. And there are new technologies that are coming up for in-memory columnar stores, such as vectorized execution. If you look into PostgreSQL's executor, it goes one row, a second row, a third row, and it does these computations one row at a time. With vectorized executor, the executor takes a block of values, goes over them in a batch, and does its computation. And we, in fact, started experimenting with a vectorized executor and have a public GitHub repo that shows our tests and the code. And in our initial tests, we saw performance improvements of 2 to 6x in query runtimes for in-memory columnar stores, too. These were the benchmark numbers. What's next? CStore is an open source project that's actively being developed. We released CStore FTW 1.2 just last week. In this release, we reduced C-Store's memory usage by 90%. Also, previously, we only supported the copy command as a way to get the data into C-Store. C-Store 1.2 makes things easier by supporting insert into select. That way, you don't need to dump your, if your data is already in Postgres, you don't need to dump it into a CSV file and load it back in. You can just use uh, insert into select. And we have many other features and bug fixes that are visible in our GitHub repo. The reason we're here is, which I think is here, we're looking for your feedback. If you have one or two features that would make you use C-Store, please do get in touch with us. We have a mailing list and our GitHub repository. And we're looking to hear from you. To wrap it all up, C-Store is an open source columnar store for PostgreSQL. For the data layout, we used ORC, the second generation RC file format. ORC gives us a columnar layout, support for different compression methods, and skip indexes. Then we put that together with the best of PostgreSQL. C store supports all PostgreSQL data types and collects statistics to serve queries faster. And it's super simple. I'll come here. You load the extension, you create your foreign table, you copy your data, and you're done. That's all I have. Thank you. Any questions?
They are evaluated together. So if you have a query that has a clause for A and a clause for B and a clause for C, as we're sc uh, scanning over the data set, we are going to evaluate all of them together. The thing that's going to happen is these are skip indexes. So basically, however the data is laid out, we're keeping track of min-max indexes for every 10,000 values. So although they are evaluated together, so we evaluate all of them together, if the data doesn't have a natural dimension to it, that we may not be skipping. So it depends on how, whether the data that you're putting in has a natural dimension to it or whether you sort it. Because the skip indexes work best when either the, there is a dimension, so your data is coming by incremental time, or you sort the data and you put it into place. One idea that we may incorporate in CSTOR 1.3 is including additional indexes so that even if your data doesn't have a natural dimension to it, you can use external indexes to skip over unrelated data. If we, after the conference, like after actually the talk, we can sit together and take a look at the data and then it's going to become clear. So if there wasn't an inherent dimension, that might have been why. But all of them are evaluated together. Could you tell me a little bit about the applications having 700 columns in a table? That's typically in data warehousing workloads. So people take all of their data and then denormalize it to a, uh, all of the data, and uh, most of these guys could be null fields. Typically, say you're looking at clickstream, and now uh, you have different properties that you're looking at that are null for a good number of the columns. So you take all the properties that you see, you denormalize it, and then that becomes your fact table. It depends on what you're looking to do. One thing that you're looking to do there is you're trying to avoid join operations particularly if you have a large data set and if it's a distributed cluster, this is one way to bypass the join, like different joins. Uh, people do it a lot. I mean, not to the, I don't know, I don't know the percentages, but then that's how they denormalize the data and then put it in around their queries. So, would it be more effective to use a document store? That's one alternative. Uh, it's really the customer's decision on terms of like, do I want to use a doc document store? Do I want to use H store or JSON B? The denormalizing part is more frequent on, I would say, data warehousing workloads where you want to impose that structure and avoid the join operations. Could be an alternative. I believe Postgres Excel uses the default uh, row-oriented store. So uh, the storage engine that comes with Postgres SQL is a row-oriented store. This is one of the extensions that we have, three extensions that we have. This lays out the data in a columnar storage format. So uh, I don't think, I guess you could load this into Postgres Excel too to get the columnar store in Postgres Excel if they haven't diverged a whole lot from regular Postgres. Does that answer your yes? How does it play with replication? It, it, the standard Postgres. It doesn't play at all. Okay. Yeah. So you could use it with CytosDB, and then CytosDB would replicate for you. Uh, or I guess with PG Shard, when it this has inserts, you could use it with PG Shard. But the regular streaming replication, it doesn't play at all, because streaming replication uses the write-ahead logs to replicate the data. And then this bypasses right headed logs altogether. So, in that vein, then how, is it, how does it play with crash safety? So, if for some reason it crashes halfway through the copy from, do you just. 
the, the data is going to be gone. Uh, when the copy completes, uh, there is a Stripe footer. So we automatically update that Stripe footer to say, this is the new size of the file. So there is one big, and then, so if it, if it crashes, your copy operation would have terminated in the middle of it. That Stripe metadata wouldn't have been updated at the very end in the footer. So you, you, would, you just wouldn't see the data. So it would be a, yeah, that's, that's it. And then I'll be here for another five, 10 minutes for other questions. Thank you.